All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Can you hear me all right in the back? OK, good. Uh, before doing anything else, uh, I want us uh, to start looking back in time. We're going to do some time travel here. And the date is Monday, the 25th of February, 2013. It's yesterday. Uh, I'm at home, sitting in Stockholm, in Hammarby Sjöstöden, a lovely suburb of Stockholm. Uh, you don't see it that well on this picture. It's a bit dark, but uh, I'm sitting in my sofa, and I'm planning for this trip. So I'm looking at uh, the confirmation email that I got from, uh, from my travel company. Uh, and this is what it looks like. This is 2013, it's yesterday, and this is what the confirmation email looks like from a travel company. Reading it on an iPhone. Isn't this silly? I mean, I'm going to London, so I'm sitting there in my sofa, grabbing my iPad instead. I really want to do something cool when I get here. Uh, I know that London is such a great city, all right? And there's a new high tower in this town, right? So it's called, I'm not going to read here. I can't read here. What's the name of this? Shard, the Shard. And The Guardian has apparently created uh, a great interactive show on the internet for us, sitting in Stockholm, for example, to be able to explore London from the chart. So I get really exciting sitting there with my iPad, and, well, too bad. Didn't work on my iPad. This is optimized for desktop computers. So let's uh, look at uh, this morning instead. I'm about to go to the airport. Uh, we have a nice uh, express train to the airport called Arlanda Express in Stockholm. So I'm actually sitting in the cab and I realized that, okay, I won't have time uh, to buy any tickets to the Arlanda Express because it's really tight, so I need to board the train immediately when, uh, when the cab arrives. Uh, so I bring up this once again in my iPhone and I want to buy a ticket. Too bad their website, their mobile website, doesn't support me buying tickets. So I will need to go to their desktop site which looks like this in a mobile phone. And uh, there's a five-step wizard of buying a ticket here. I tried to complete this. Four steps in, uh, the cab arrived to the station, and I missed the train. Two. So this is just two examples of, I would say, how customers or how websites try to force customers into specific channels. So they're saying like, you know, okay, you're accessing in the mobile channel. Sorry, you can't buy tickets there. Uh, okay, you're using uh, the iPad channel. Well, we don't have the interactive slideshow in that uh, channel. Sorry for you. And I think this is more like acting web content management in 1999 than 2013. And this is just two examples, and there are several more. And I know that you have experienced it as well. As well. Uh, my name is Peter, and I'm working as a product manager at EpiServer. We're working with uh, digital marketing and e-commerce platforms. We also have a stand outside here if you want to look at it later. But I want to go ahead and uh, keep uh, the year is, once again, 1999. And everyone is talking about uh, Steve Jobs and Apple and uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, his uh, recent book, etc. But I want to focus on Bill Gates instead. Bill Gates, 1999, he came out with this book, Business at the Speed of Thought. And just that you're using the at sign like that tells you that this is a really old book, right? But what does he say in this book? Well, he has a specific thing which is called the diagnosing your digital neural system. This is pretty much your online presence with today's term. Uh, but uh, he asked you two questions. And this is uh, 15 years ago. So we should think that this is something you should check to make sure that your website really is up to standard, right? Will your web infrastructure enable you to easily incorporate video and phone support in the future? That's the first question. The second one is, do your digital system enable you to provide a personalized experience for customers who come to your website? Once again, 15 years ago, how many can say yes to these two questions today, just looking at your own websites? Not that many, right. This is 15 years back. What has happened? Well, we got uh, Twitter, at least. So when working today with content, it's usually lots of duplication of content. 
You may have one uh, content branch for, for your website, another one for your mobile site, and if you're working with uh, different markets, there may be yet another content branch. And this is something that uh, we used to refer to as content forking. Content forking is really bad, because it means that whenever you need to do an update, you will need to do that update in several places. So it's a nightmare in terms of maintenance. Still, we see a lot of customers doing this today. That was the first problem. Another problem with, uh, uh, with both mobile and your website is that you're guessing what the mobile user wants. So in terms of the Arland Express train that, OK, no, on the mobile website, we should only display the time schedule. It should not be possible to buy tickets, because they won't buy tickets on the mobile site. That's one example. But if we then look at the recent study here, they say that 84% are doing mobile at home. So they're using the mobile phone, maybe by sitting in the sofa, as an example. Whereas many think that, OK, no, mobile is something we only do when we're out in the street shopping, etc. So we only want to see the closest store. That's what we want to use the mobile channel for. 74% use the mobile when waiting in lines. 64% use the mobile at work. So what does this say us? Well, if you're doing something for mobile, you will need to find out the scenarios where your customers will be using that mobile and accessing your site. It may be at the airport, as in this example, with Lufthansa. Lufthansa had their mobile site like this, so there was no difference if I was at the airport. It just showed me the possibility to see recent flight and check-in, as it was when I was sitting in the sofa. The exact same experience with their mobile app. And a recent study among the top 1,000 Fortune companies in the US showed that marketers only depend on data when taking customer-related decisions. And 11% of the decisions are based on actual facts or on data. And why is this? I mean, today, everyone is talking about big data. We have access to data. Why isn't everyone using it if we have access to all this data? We have the analytics tools, we have engagement analysis, we have all of this. But marketers aren't using it, so, so why is that? Is it because still the data isn't available when you need it? Or is it just too much data so you can't filter out what's important? And that's why you can't take decisions on it. I think uh, when working with content today, you will need to be prepared that the content that you're working with can be displayed everywhere. Right now, maybe we think, OK, this content should be in the channel web, or this content should be in the channel mobile, or in the channel social. We need to think about that the content that I create can be available and can be displayed everywhere. Because if it, if it can go, it will, the data will go. And this is just a few examples of where the web will be in the future. And I know that uh, the refrigerator, you've seen that uh, uh, 10 years back as well. And no, the web never really came to the refrigerator. But there are other examples, such as this uh, watch from, uh, from Pebble, which is one of the first uh, connected watches which has uh, become really popular. Started off as a Kickstarter project, and now we they have, OK, I'm sorry, but uh, the screen is apparently very dark. But th this, it is a watch that you're, <laughs> that you're looking at here. Believe me, I can see it on my screen at least. But what I want to say here is that uh, content will reside on different screen sizes. So when created content, you will need to make sure that it works across a variety of different screen sizes. And uh, many people refer to this as responsive design, which is one technique for this, which is great. So instead of working with fixed dimensions when working with layouts, etc., you say, OK, I have flexible dimensions, and the content will flow. So it's up to the interaction designer to decide how content will flow when I'm using flexible widths. So when you have set up those different rules, you make sure that the content will look great, no matter the screen size. And by doing that, we're future proof, because we know whenever a new device comes, etc., as soon as we know its screen size, we will be able to present the information to it. However, 
Some people say that responsive web design only optimizes content for different screen sizes, not for the customers. So take uh, the Lufthansa example once again. I mean, uh, apparently they have made a great site, works with mobile, but there was no difference uh, uh, if I used it on the airport compared to if I used it in the sofa. It was only the screen size that that content was optimized for. So we will need to start thinking more in terms of context. Context will be the important thing moving forward. And right now, the context, uh, we, maybe we don't have as many signals as we'll have in the future. And with signals, I mean like your position, uh, maybe what you have been doing previously. Uh, if uh, you are within a radius uh, uh, of a shop, uh, for example. There are several different examples of when context can be used. And mobility is really driving context. And we see this in all the uh, different map applications. We see that when we do searches and we can present search results based on where, where you're positioned. And we see that when we do digital marketing and ads and banners, how close are you to a specific spot? What have your friends been doing in this area previously, etc.? That's a typical example of context. And okay, I've been bl blaming the Lufthansa app a lot, uh, but actually recently they added uh, support for what's called Passbook within the iPhone. So what they did was that they added context support to their app, which means that uh, whenever I, uh, uh, I book a flight within Lufthansa and I get to the airport with my iPhone, it will automatically show uh, that, uh, that booking when I get to the airport because it will recognize using near field communication that I'm close to a check in disk and then it will just display that uh, uh, specific confirmation. So they have added context awareness into their, uh, into their mobile app, which is great. There you have it. Okay, so what is the context I'm talking about all the time? Uh, Forrester, Hewlett Forrester defines that context, the sum total of what is known about an individual along with what he or she is currently experiencing. So this actually means that we're taking everything that we know about the surrounding world where you're at, but we're also using what you have been doing previously and maybe what your friends have been doing previously and by using that information, we can target a message for you or give you a specific offering. So that's utilizing the context. And uh, maybe this is your next pair of glasses, Google Glass. Google Glass takes the context one step further. Instead of having it in, it in your phone, it connects it to your glasses. I mean, it, it will give you information when you're walking around, for example, in this uh, conference area, it can get, give you information when you get, get to different stands. Maybe what uh, your friends have, have been saying about these different brands, uh, but also other things such as uh, letting you uh, just uh, take a picture and send it uh, uh, to, uh, to social network, etc. Everything adding context without disturbing you at all. So this is Google Glass. It's planned to be released uh, later this year. If you, haven't, uh, if you haven't seen it, I really recommend that you just uh, watch a video on, on YouTube about it because it sort of takes the, the context awareness to another stage, and you really get to realize how important the context will be in the future. So what I'm trying to say is that today's channel is tomorrow's context. Instead of saying that, this content should live in the web channel. This should live on the uh, desktop channel. This should live in the social channel. The important thing is that when you're creating content, you make sure that it can live everywhere, maybe using responsive design, etc. cetera, so it makes sure it fits different screen sizes. But also when working with that content, you say that, okay, if I know this specific information, then this is what should be displayed. So you take advantage of the different signals that you get from the context when creating that when they're creating that specific banner or teaser or information text. So that's the important thing. Instead of thinking about channels, you think about content that should be available everywhere, but utilize the context surrounding it uh, when the, the user reads that specific information. <clears throat> Some people refer to this as uh, customer experience management. It's all about the customer center. It's the customer who defines the channels is not you who define the channels. And Forrest will also say that 
uh, they don't call it the channels, they call it touch points, just to give you a sense that, no, this is where that customer is touching your company. It's not your inside-out channel, it's how the customer reaches out to you. So the important thing with uh, uh, engagement management is, of course, to manage the different experiences. Wherever the customer wants to reach you, they want, need to get a great experience. And that experience needs to be aware of, once again, the context. And for you to be able to optimize this, you need to be able to take advantage of data, to see patterns, how your uh, different customers are using these systems to be able to target your messaging better. And that's how the big data comes into play. <clears throat> so if we look back again uh, to this morning, I actually took, as I said, a taxi to, uh, to the central station to take all on the express. And uh, I used uh, my, my app for booking the cab. And uh, it's also using context because it can immediately see where I live. It uh, picked up the street automatically. OK, you're staying at Lundi Salé 31 in Stockholm. Uh, that's just where we're going to pick you up. Do you want us to pick us up now or later? And it will also use, actually, uh, how I've been using this app previously and when doing recommendations to me or just suggesting, suggesting for example, the destination. And uh, another great example who's utilizing the context in a better way is, uh, is TripIt. So the, the booking confirmation you saw earlier that I got from my travel agency, I just forward that to TripIt. TripIt will forward it for me, uh, will format it for me in a very friendly way so I can exactly see uh, uh, when I'm going to travel, when I'm coming back, etc. And if I have bookings at hotels, etc., it will summarize everything in a really nice travel plan for me. And it's also used in the social aspects, so I can see if my friends are nearby, and, uh, as well as uh, serving me ads for British Airways, based on that. So, it's all about experiences. For marketers who need to be able to create experience for their customers, they need to be able to deliver those experiences, and they need to be able to optimize those experiences. So let's take a look at that look with the customer in center. The customer exists in a given context, given position. We know something about his history and so on. He's using a specific device, but the only thing we care about, OK, what's the screen size of that? device because we have created content that is flexible that works on any screen size he may be using the web he may be using a social he may be reading an email or he may be using an app so he may be accessing social from uh, from a phone or from a web etc so that's different touch points how he is connecting uh, to you we need to be able to create experiences Using content, if we're doing digital marketing, or if you're also working with e-commerce, we want to, to use products for this. We want to be able to target this customer based on his behavior, what he's been doing previously, as well as the context. I wonder how many times I will be say the context during this presentation. I think it's maybe 40 times already. We also want to analyze what we're doing. So how is it reaching the different goals that we have set up? How does it convert to those goals? And how is the engagement? How much social influence does it have? Does it drives, uh, uh, drive traffic from social sites and so on? We need to analyze this. And last but not least, we need to optimize his experiences. So we need to make sure that uh, 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 by testing different scenarios, we can see the ones uh, he likes the most or converts the most. Uh, uh, which scenarios makes him buy, buy the most products, which uh, scenarios makes him download the most white papers, and so on. And we need to be able to optimize this. And testing maybe whole scenarios or specific content pieces based on context, but also uh, based on how we present that actual content. If we look at it from a more traditional way, hierarchical, we have the content at the bottom. We need to create experiences based on that content. It's very important when we create those experiences that we get an exact preview of what it will look like in the different ways it will, will be presented later. On the small screen size, on the large screen size, as a small teaser, as a large teaser, and so on. When you create the content, you will need 
you must be able to see exactly what it looks like everywhere it can be presented. You also need to be able to reuse uh, the content across, uh, for example, different markets. Very important. Then you need to deliver this content. So delivering should uh, be based on two different touch points, of course. All the touch points that you have previously previewed when you created them. But the preview delivery layer also needs to make sure that you can target this content based on, uh, on the context. So uh, we're delivering this across different touch points. And we have analytics that goes across all these different touch points. And then we want to optimize it based on the analytics that we get back. And we can do that by testing, as I said, whole scenarios or just specific parts that are being reused across different sites or referred to as multivariate testing here. OK, but let's say that we have set up all this system. Who should take care of it? Well, it will be a lot of work if we need to optimize all different scenarios. And that's why the last bullet here is very important. I don't know if you can read it. That's the self-optimization part, making the system learn how the customer, which content the customer converts the most from, being able to set up different variations, and the variation that converts the most will automatically be the one that's being used the most on the site. That's the self-optimization part. OK, so let's just uh, deep dive into these different layers a little bit more. Create experiences. As I said, content lies at the heart of all marketing. So it's very important that you can create the right experiences. You should only be able to create the same content once, but be able to use it everywhere. But the key factor to be able to do that is the instant preview. You have created your teaser. How does it look as a small one or big one? How does it look when presented on your Facebook page? How does it look when presented uh, on your regular website, etc.? All these different scenarios, where this content can live, we will need to be able to preview that at the time that we create it. And for that to work, we need to have these adaptive templates that don't have a fixed specific width, but instead uses a flexible width that makes uh, the content flow across different screen sizes. And that's where the automatic layout comes in. When creating content, you as a marketer or editor, you shouldn't need to think about, OK, does this look right or will it look right? That's something that the AD or the designer have already set up for you. And the interaction designer has decided how it should flow across your site. So the, the, uh, the layout should be taken care of based on the interaction sketches. We also need to create social experiences. We know that there are quite a few social networks today, so we'll need to manage them in one place and not logging into several different social networks. In these social networks right now, we can see that, that there are different audiences. So you will probably need to target your content based on that audience's uh, uh, different behavior and, and the context of that audience. And coming back from social networks, you know that you will get the engagement analysis. And that's uh, the number of likes, the number of comments, the number of retweets. How can you turn that into real figures who shows the actual return on investment of the social, uh, or how you're working with content is social? And we need to be able to do this in real time. We can't wait one week or one day for the results to come back. We will need to have it available as soon as uh, customers start interacting with your content. That's why it's so important that everything, you both get the analysis in real time, and you can make changes to the content in real time. The next layer, deliver experiences. So we've been talking about screens, uh, channels, and touch points. But did someone say context is king? Yes, I've probably been saying that quite a few times during these presentations. So here's the typical setup. We got the content management system. We know that we should be able to deliver content to several different places. But the most important thing is we shouldn't treat one specific uh, channel or one specific screen site as, uh, uh, as the dominant one. Because maybe we want to work mobile first. If we're taking that initiative, then we should be able to work mobile first and then see how that reflects to the other screen sizes. The same goes across channels. Which market is dominant? Which market do you want to work with? That's something you as an editor or marketer should be able to decide yourself. 
So we shouldn't make any difference between a desktop, a mobile, and a tablet. Content targeting them. When working with content, so you have created your content, you know that it can live everywhere, it looks great, now you need to be able to target it. You need to be, then to have different rules that you can work with based on the behavior of, of, uh, of your customer or your anonymous visitor and the context is currently in and maybe specific business rules of your company that you want to apply to this content. And you need to be able to do this everywhere. And this means that if you in, in one specific uh, touch point have uh, information about uh, a location and maybe uh, what, uh, what the customer's friends are liking, for example, then you should be able to use that information in that touch point. But if you don't have that information available somewhere else, you will still be able to use the same content in that other place. And as I said earlier, this is also something that needs to be taken care of in real time and be able to change in real time to adapt to today's web. And last but not least, we need to optimize this experience. So A-B test, testing the whole scenario, multivariate testing, testing smaller content parts that builds up a whole page or a whole scenario for, for the end visitor, getting real-time insights, and last but not least, having the self-optimized content that makes it less work for you as an editor or as a marketer, but still you know that the system will learn by itself and present the alternative that is most uh, likely to succeed. The analytics part <clears throat> is something that you will need to have a go good overview of all your different touch points, but still when working with, the, with content, you need the detailed insights. When working with a specific teaser, you will need to know how that teaser has performed previously. Maybe how it's performed uh, in social, how it's uh, been performing on your website, how it's been performing when uh, accessed uh, in a native app and so on. That's something that you will need to have when working with the content and not in a separate system. And most importantly, being able to track the conversions because that's the only way you can see results from content. If you set up a pre-specific goal, setting up a goal should be as Im important as creating the content. Every content should have a goal so that you can be able to optimize it later. Okay, so I've been talking a lot about uh, the experience and the customer experience, but I also think that your experience and working with this is maybe the most important part. And uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you. <laughs>